Hello, Merfolk fans. I'm Joe. Thanks very much for joining me today. This morning I played a really fun match, very interesting match against a uh, green-red devotion deck. Uh, so I'm going to show you the replay here, um, and hopefully you enjoy it as much as I did. Looking at the opening hands, we see that I had uh, three lands, including a Cavern of Souls and two Mutavaults, an Aether Vial, a Silvergill Adept, a Harbinger of the Tides, and a Lord of Atlantis. Uh, pretty solid Merfolk hand. Uh, it could use, I guess, one extra blue source, but with Aether Vial, we're probably not going to have any trouble getting our double blue creatures onto the battlefield. And as it stands, we don't have any spells like Spreading Seas or Echoing Truth that actually require strict blue mana. Mutavaults are going to be useful as additional attackers, so this is uh, almost certainly a keep. Looking at the opponent's side of things, I see a uh, very mana-intensive hand. We've got three red here, two green, two green, two green, two green, one green. And with only uh, a land that produces colorless mana, this is obviously a mulligan. Let's take another look at those cards, though. Kiki Jiki Mirror Breaker. Um, <laughs> okay, moving on, we see Garrick Wild Speaker. Uh, a staple of uh, green devotion decks. Courser of Crufix for incidental life gain and uh, card advantage, getting the uh, lands off the top of the deck. Tooth and Nail, very strong uh, combo card. I don't know what the target is for Kikijiki to go off with, um, but presumably uh, Tooth and Nail, if you cast with Entwine, you can go search for Kikijiki and something else and just have him go nuts. Eternal Witness to get anything back from the graveyard, uh, and really good for green devotion. Uh, just an all-around great card in these kinds of decks, and Bird of Paradise uh, for the ramp. But as I said, uh, this is an obvious mulligan. So uh, let's see how those mulligan decisions went. Uh, the opponent goes down to six. Uh, we're going to see a forest with Utopia Sprawl for ramp. Uh, Nykthos, Burning Tree Emissary, Garrick Wildspeaker, and Kikijiki. It's a much better hand, I think. The opponent gets to scry, so that's probably going to be a keep. I'll tell him that I keep. He's thinking about it, and he decides to keep. Okay, after scrying, he decides to keep the card on the top of his deck. We'll see what that is shortly. I'm going to open with Cavern of Souls, hoping to draw into another blue source so I can uh, drop one of these creatures if need be. Um, but um, actually, Mute Vault is going to be enough to cast Silvergill, so we're set on mana for the time being. So for the turn, uh, let's see, the opponent uh, had all of these cards and drew into what? One, two, three, four, five. Uh, it drew into another Utopia Sprawl. So that's what he chose to keep on the top of his deck. So he plays Utopia Sprawl naming red. Uh, so whenever he taps this forest, he's going to also add red mana. On my turn, I'll take Aether Vial up to one. I draw a Curse Catcher, which is great because it's going to make this Aether Vial extremely efficient. I'm going to cast Silvergill here, uh, revealing Lord of Atlantis. Most opponents assume that we have at least one Island Walk Lord in our hand anyway. Revealing it doesn't actually give them that much information. And uh, if he wants to try to cast any instant or sorcery, I can still surprise him with Curse Catcher. So off of the Silvergill, I draw another Silvergill. That's a nice draw. So for the opponent's turn, uh, he's going to tap his forest for green and red. Cast Burning Tree Emissary, floating green and red now. Uh, tapping Nykthos for three green, uh, three green mana, I guess. Uh, so using one of those mana to cast a Utopia Sprawl, again naming red on this single forest. Okay, and just going to empty his mana pool there. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with the card Utopia Sprawl, uh, it's an interesting one. It says, Enchant Forest. The land that it's enchanting has to be a forest. So if we draw a Spreading Seas and put it onto this forest, the forest becomes an island, and these Utopia Sprawls actually fall off the land and just go straight to the graveyard. So uh, Spreading Seas can be a huge blowout against Mono Green Devotion for this reason, especially when they double down on a single land, putting multiple Utopia Sprawls on it. Um, it's similar to uh, when you, say, um, put Rancor onto a Mutavault or something like that. Uh, Mutavault can, is a creature when Rancor is applied, but when, at the end of the turn when Mutavault stops being a creature, the Rancor falls off, goes to the graveyard, and comes back to your hand. Uh, same with trying to equip, um, say, a um, Cranial Plating onto an Ink Moth Nexus in Affinity. 
after the opponent attacks, the cranial plating will fall off because the Inkmoth Nexus is no longer a creature, and cranial plating can only be equipped to a creature. Uh, Utopia's Pearl can only be attached to a forest, so if it becomes an island, it goes to the graveyard. At the end of my turn, I'm going to go ahead and bring in Curse Catcher. Put Ether Isle up to 2, draw a Dismember, it's a, quite a good draw, it's going to just let me push damage this turn. So um, I'm going to start this turn by using my mana efficiently, tapping the Cavern and the Mutavault to bring in the Silvergill, revealing the same Lord of Atlantis. Off of that I'll draw another Silvergill, another great draw. Uh, just choosing to be really aggressive this turn, I'm going to play the Mutavault, cast Dismember going down to four, uh, 16 life, and kill the Burning Tree Emissary. I'll bring in the Lord, swing with my Silvergill and Curse Catcher for 3 and 2 for a total of 5. Opponent goes down to 15. Now at this point, uh, the opponent has 2 Devotion on the table between these 2 enchantments. For the turn, it looks like he hit a Bird's Paradise. Thinks about it for a little while, taps the forest, producing uh, 1 green and 2 red. Actually activates Nykthos with two of that mana. It's a little bit tricky how he's tapping here. He doesn't explain it, but we can figure it out. He taps for green, red, red. He's probably using the uh, the two red uh, to activate Nykthos. He had, again, the two, um, two Devotion with the two Utopia Sprawls. So the two red uh, activating Nykthos, getting two green. I had another green floating, cast Eternal Witness. Um, it doesn't get anything back from his graveyard. Actually, no, no, I'm sorry. Uh, it gets back Burning Tree Emissary. Um, let's see, how did this actually work out? <laughs> he plays it, he puts Burning Tree Emissary into play from his graveyard. Um, so this is supposed to return a card from the graveyard to his hand. Uh, I think he's pretty much just scooping here. Um, a little bit weird how he just threw all these cards out. Uh, he needed to tap all his lands just to be able to play the Eternal Witness. At that point, he had no more mana left, so I don't know where these other creatures are coming from. Okay, so yeah, I think he realized that um, <laughs> that that he couldn't actually play those creatures. So that was uh, the opponent just scooped at that point. I had a lot of pressure. So a pretty quick game, a pretty strong Merfolk game. Let's see how the second game went. Okay, looking at the opening hands, I have three lands, including plenty of blue sources, an ether vial uh, for a little bit of ramp, uh, dismember to deal with any problematic creatures, echoing truth to deal with any problematic permanents, and a single merfolk. For me, this is a keep. We could easily draw into plenty of merfolk. There's, there's 28 other merfolk in the deck right now. Um, looking at the opponent's side of things, he has three lands, uh, Emrockle, along with Tooth and Nail, which is a little bit scary, because if he gets up to 7 mana for Tooth and Nail, he can put Emrakul into play. Utopia, Sprawl, and Arbor Elf are going to help him a lot with ramping, so that's a, a definite keep for the opponent. We see he already said keep as soon as he saw it, and I decided to keep as well. So I drew into a Tidebinder Mage, which is going to be solid in this match. I think about it a little bit whether I want to dismember, but just as far as tempo goes, we can't really beat uh, land into... Um, Ether Vial. I chose to lead with Cavern of Souls because the opponent could very easily uh, have sideboarded in Choke. He mentioned how he has a really hard time game one against Merfolk, which seems to indicate that he has some strong sideboard options against Merfolk, and there he goes, drawing into Choke. So let's see how the opponent's turn went. He plays his second forest, taps it to add Utopia Sprawl onto the other forest, naming uh, Green, I believe. Yep. Then he's going to tap this twice using Arbor Elf and plays out Choke. So it was a very good decision to play out the Cavern of Souls on my first turn. On my upkeep, I'll put Aether Vial up to one counter. Go ahead and draw. We continue to hit Merfolk, so this keep is looking better and better. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead, tap to uh, Mana, and play Tidebinder Mage, locking down his Arbor Elf. The uh, decision here was basically uh, made because he has um, a forest with this enchantment on it making extra mana, so this Arbor Elf actually taps for two mana. So locking him down is going to be really important. Uh, yes, this island is not going to untap next turn, but I have an Echoing Truth um, that I can strategically deploy with my other island to bounce choke at my opponent's end step and still get uh, use out of my islands. 
So for now, we're just going to try to slow the opponent down by locking him down with Tide Binder Mage. Next turn, the Aether Vial will be on two, and we'll be able to uh, keep putting threats on the table. So the opponent untapped and drew Corsair of Crufix, pretty solid. Uh, it's going to help them hit their lands. Alright, the opponent plays out Nykthos and passes the turn. So my island is going to stay tapped, Aether Vial is going to go up to 2, and I drew into another Lord. So things have gone quite well as far as my draws are concerned. Uh, I think a little bit this turn about what I want to do. I could um, choose to dismember the Corsair of Crufix. Um, I could yeah, dismember the Corsair of Crufix, bring in a Lord of Atlantis, and just start attacking. Uh, that's one way to go about it. Uh, another way to go about it is to play the island and wait until the opponent's end step to bounce choke. Uh, and I think ultimately that's going to be the better play. Next turn, the Aether Isle can go up to three to bring in Mara Regiri, and we can get some tap effects out of our Merfolk that we cast. All right, so I thought about it a little while. It's a pretty tricky decision to be aggressive or wait a turn. The opponent draws into Birds of Paradise, which is great. If we look at his mana right now, he's got Nykthos, and currently only, well, he has one, two, three, four, five devotion. Uh, so it's getting up there. It's getting up there. Let's see if he could actually choose to cast Tooth and Nail this turn. If he taps this land, activates Nykthos, he would have, like I said, uh, five devotion plus one land is only six mana. So he plays the Birds of Paradise and chooses to pass the turn. So on the opponent's end step, I'm going to uh, cast Echoing Truth, targeting Choke. Choke will go back to the opponent's hand. I'll activate Aether Vial to bring in uh, one of my Island Walk Lords. Go to my turn on my upkeep. Uh, I'll put Aether Vial up to three just to get maximum sort of tap value uh, with my creatures. And it drew into another Merfolk, so uh, putting this up to three is, was a good decision because I'm going to get to use my mana really well this turn. So Mero Regiri enters the battlefield. I go ahead, cast the uh, Curse Catcher to get his effect on the table. I'll use Mero Regiri to untap that land. Follow up with a Lord of Atlantis untapping the island uh, so that Choke doesn't lock it down next turn. Now with a 5-4, sorry, a 5-5 five, five and a 4-4 four, four on my side of the table, I'm going to go ahead and uh, attack. The opponent's at 21 life, uh, is going to take 9 and uh, go down to 12. I'll pass the turn, uh, leaving Dismember up. I see Xenagos at the top of his library. It's an interesting card. It's a very interesting deck my opponent is playing. So let's see how his next turn uh, works out. <clears throat> Now, uh, we calculated the Devotion last turn. It was increased uh, with the Birds of Paradise. So at this point, he has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 Devotion. Actually, it was 6, but I bounced Choke. <clears throat> so he has 5 Devotion. If he taps this, he'll have 5 mana from Nykthos, and then 2 other mana will give him access to Tooth and Nail. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with Xenagos, God of the Revels, it's not a very popular card in modern. It's uh, one of the... Uh, gods from Theros block. Uh, he's a legendary enchantment creature. Indestructible. As long as his devotion to red and green is less than 7, Xenagos isn't a creature. At the beginning of combat on your turn, another creature you control gains haste and gets plus x plus x until the end of turn, where x is that creature's power. So, this card combos uh, sort of extremely well with Emrakul, because if they both come out onto the table, Emrakul's attacking with haste, and he's getting plus X plus X, where X is its power. So it's attacking as a 30-15 with Annihilator 6. So uh, I have a feeling the opponent is going to try to resolve Tooth and Nail here. Okay, so uh, they go ahead and tap all of their lands. Uh, two Forest activating Nykthos for uh, 5 Devotion, These, this last forest providing 2 more mana. For 7 mana, the opponent's going to choose the, the second mode of Tooth and Nail, uh, where you can put up to 2 creature cards from your hand onto the battlefield. Now typically with this card, you're not going to have 2 combo pieces just sitting in your hand. In this case, the opponent does have both combo pieces. Um, I have a Curse Catcher in hand, but the opponent fortunately has access to this Birds of Paradise. 
So we're working with extremely narrow margins here, and the opponent is going to get to resolve this tooth and nail. <clears throat> and there's nothing I can do again about it, so um, in the end I'm going to let it resolve. The opponent puts uh, Xenogos and Emrakul onto the battlefield, and is going to go ahead straight to uh, combat. However, um, I haven't passed priority. I tell him to hang on. Go back to our main phase for a moment. Now, I have a dismember in hand. Xenogos is a creature because he exa has exactly seven uh, devotion to green and red. He has two from Xenogos, three, four, five, six, seven. So Xenogos is a creature and can totally be targeted by dismember. Now, dismember gives a creature minus five, minus five. It doesn't uh, technically destroy a creature. Um, it makes its toughness zero, and then state-based actions... Uh, moves the creature to the graveyard because uh, creatures can't have zero toughness. So um, Xenoghost says at the beginning of combat on your turn, that's a trigger. And if I get rid of Xenoghost before combat, uh, that's not going to trigger. Emrakul's not going to get to attack this turn. So um, I do play the dismember, go from 20 down to 16. I'm going to uh, dismember Xenoghost. The opponent thinks about it for a little while. Probably pretty surprised that that's the one card I had in my hand. All right, Xenoghost goes to the graveyard, and the opponent has no choice but to pass the turn. So for my turn, unfortunately, I hit a land. Um, <clears throat> so in this spot, I'm, I'm staring down um, an Emrakul with another Tooth and Nail on the opponent's, uh, the top of the opponent's deck. We can see that because of the Courser of Crufix. Um, the opponent we saw last turn has access to... 7 mana, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 devotion for Nykthos, and then 2 more mana. He can cast Tooth and Nail again, but we know that the only card that he has in hand is the Choke. So um, the opponent could go and dig for creatures using the first mode of Tooth and Nail, but he won't be able to entwine it because he only has the Birds of Paradise, I guess, for uh, 1 more mana in addition to the 7 for casting Tooth and Nail. If he did draw into a land next turn, he would be able to entwine it, get two creatures, and put both creatures onto the table. We saw Kiki Jiki, so certainly he has some sort of crazy combo. I guess Kiki Jiki can copy Emrakul, but it's legendary, so that doesn't work. Uh, so for my part, I was feeling really pressured and uh, lined up my creatures and didn't give it too much thought. I definitely thought a little bit about it, played my land, went to attacks, tapped everybody. Now... I pretty much immediately realized that this was not what I wanted to do, um, but I I really don't like taking back moves on Cockatrice um, if I can avoid it. Um, in hindsight, sort of immediate hindsight, I realized I should probably not have attacked with the Tidebinder Mage. I didn't want to get the Tidebinder Mage blocked and allow him to untap his Arbor Elf, but that because that gives him access to that Entwine Mana for Tooth and Nail. Um, but as I said, I'm not a big fan of Takesies Backsies, but I have to guess that if this was in Paper Magic and I had to tap each creature one by one and then really think about it, I probably would have not attacked with the Tidebinder Mage, especially looking that the opponent has 2 plus 15 for 17, so just enough lethal to crack back with the course of Crufix and Emrakul. Well, including the Arbor Elf, it's going to be 18 because he can just block and kill my Tidebinder Mage. So as I mentioned, pretty much immediately realized this was a mistake and made me pretty sad because... Um, that dismember play on Xenagos was really cool. If we take a second and think about how I could have done this differently, if I attacked with everybody except the Tidebinder Mage, uh, the opponent could have choose, chosen to uh, eat one of my lords, and he would have taken 4, 4, and 4 uh, going down to 12, or he could have chosen, chosen to um, chump block with a Corsair of Crufix and eat one of my lords with Emrakul, in which case he would only take 8 damage uh, going down to 5, um, let's see, in the case that he just blocked one lord, killing him, I would have the Tidebinder up. If he attacked with Emrakul next turn, uh, I would have to sacrifice uh, probably my four lands, Aether Vial, and Curse Catcher. But I would still have these three guys up. Now the opponent would be at one. If they attack with Emrakul, uh, they could leave up three creatures for, or two creatures for blocks. I don't know. I feel like I would have had a much better chance. As it stands, I'm dead on the board with this attack, and it was an obvious mistake. But um, <laughs> I, I chose not to take it back, and the opponent is going to choose to um, chump with the birds on the curse catcher and uh, eat my Tidebinder Mage. He's going to get to untap his Arbor Elf. He's going to get to swing with all three creatures, and I have no defense. So the opponent attacked, and I had to scoop. 
So that was a pretty spectacular game. Um, very exciting. A slight misstep on my part at the end. I don't know how much of a difference it would have made because uh, the opponent drew into this tooth and nail and could have resolved it. Um, especially with extra mana with Arbor Elf, he could have, let's see, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, um, devotion. Now, um, Arbor Elf can untap a forest, so you can make four mana with this. Let's see, tap these three for four mana with devotion. Four more with this. He could have cast Tooth and Nail, but not really put anything into play. Uh, if I left up Tidebinder Mage, I could have blocked the Courser of Crufix. Um, if, he, if he even chose to attack with the Courser of Crufix, probably wouldn't have. I, I would have destroyed uh, these three, and then I, I could have had, I don't know, Lethal on the Crackback. So I could have had that game. It was a, it was a real bummer, but the opponent took it. Um, have to have to stay sharp the entire time. <laughs> I was really excited by the dismember play, and I think just was a little bit hasty declaring my attackers. So um, for the third game, looking at the opening uh, hands, the opponent's already jumped down to six. Uh, I have three lands, two Curse Catchers, a Spreading Seas, and a Master of the Pearl Trident. It's an excellent hand. Uh, the opponent has a Forest with uh, two Monodorks, two Garricks. It's a little bit awkward, a Burning Tree Emissary. I have to imagine that's going to be a keep on their side. He doesn't like it very much. He scries and leaves uh, whatever was up there. Okay, well, they hit a land. That's, that's pretty nice. Going to open up with Arbor Elf. And then for my turn... Now, I have the choice here... To put a Spreading Seas on his forest, he seemed uh, uncertain about that hand. Made me think that maybe he was really short on lands or something. The Arbor Elf can only untap forests, so if I throw the Spreading Seas on there, suddenly his ramp is is quite uh, weak, and uh, and I can then continue to develop my board after that. Uh, however, I do have two Lords in hand, another creature. I've got enough lands, and I can always use Spreading Seas next turn. So I decide uh, to do what Merfolk does best and just be really aggressive, especially on the play. So I play out Wanderwine Hub, play Master of the Pearl Trident, and attack with Curse Catcher for two, bringing the opponent down to 18. The opponent plays his Rootbound Crag, which comes into play on untapped because he controls a forest. He's going to play Burning Tree Emissary, floating green and red, and plays out his Birds of Paradise. Okay, so the opponent's continuing uh, his plan of ramping in the early game. I draw into another Spreading Seas. Uh, the opponent has two lands. Uh, we can potentially slow him down uh, with our Spreading Seas, but he does have access now to Birds of Paradise. Um, so I'm going to continue my aggro plan this turn. Uh, I'm going to put both of my creatures out onto the table. Uh, Lord of Atlantis. Now, uh, for those of you unfamiliar with uh, some of the typical turn four wins for Merfolk, uh, it involves getting out a lot of creatures uh, really fast. And some of them have to be lords. So in this case, we see the opponent is at 18. I'm going to be attacking here for 3 and 3. And if the opponent takes that and goes down to 12, the next turn we're going to be attacking for 3, 3, 3, and 3, which is exactly lethal. And we have two spreading seas uh, to get Island Walk online. So let's see if the opponent shows any blocks. Now as a devotion deck, they typically don't want to chump block or even double block a lord or something like that because then they go radically down on their devotion. The opponent takes 6, and we can see that we're set for a lethal attack next turn. The opponent hits his land, which, which is very good uh, as far as sort of smoothing out the way that their opening hand looked. They're going to play a Garrick and make a Beast uh, just to create some blockers and try to slow me down a little bit. But at this point, I already know the opponent is dead, unless they have something like uh, Arbor Elf untaps Forest and dismember one of my lords or something. So I draw a Wanderwine Hub, which is a little bit awkward because I don't have any Merfolk in hand. So I'll go ahead and play one Spreading Seas. See what I draw off of the, uh, the Spreading Seas. I hit Immutable Vault, so that's great because I can play the second Spreading Seas just as backup in case he somehow magically destroys the first one. So I'll play the second Spreading Seas. Draw into a Master of Waves, and as I mentioned, uh, with access to Island Walk, we're going to go ahead and attack for Lethal. Now this is... A turn 4 win. It doesn't happen very often uh, with Merfolk. Modern decks put up a lot of resistance usually, and one of our lords is usually getting uh, lightning bolted or remanded or something, but uh, I push damage early in the game and it paid off because Island Walk is going to allow me just to uh, win on turn 4. It's very exciting. Uh, the opponent uh, 
doing quite well with uh, his development. He had a planeswalker on the table with, with a lot of blockers. Was doing really well with his mana developments. Uh, had an eternal witness in case I, he wants to get back any of his creatures. A replacement Garrick. If he drew into something like a tooth and nail, he's getting pretty close to that kind of mana, I think. One, two, three, four, five. And he can untap two lands with Garrick. So if he tapped one, two, three, four, five, and then two more, he already has tooth and nail mana. So opponent was doing really well, but the spreading seas allowed us to push the issue and um, end the game sooner than uh, the opponent thought. So uh, the opponents, the opponent just realized he lost. Um, commented a little bit about uh, how good that second game was. The opponent says that Merfolk is a really rough matchup for him. I, I tell him that in the second game I should have waited for my attack. Um, I think Merfolk is a little favored in this kind of matchup. It's just it's just a little too fast, I think, for them to keep up a lot of the time. I tell him I really like the uh, the Nykthos Devotion decks. I think they're really cool. I actually played one for a little while in Modern, but ultimately I was I was starting to play Merfolk back then, and Merfolk just... Uh, captured my attention and I just ran with it and I think I ultimately sold off the pieces for the uh, for the mono green devotion deck the opponent says that this deck is actually still budget which is pretty cool because it's a pretty sweet deck and allows allows you to you know get into modern so uh, yeah that was it thanks so much guys for watching I hope you enjoyed the match please uh, leave some comments subscribe if you haven't already and yeah I'll catch you in the next video thanks again